For more on COVID-19 latest, uh, joining us in Seoul, Dr. Alice Kim Kyung Tan, internist at the Mies Medin Women's Hospital from South Korea. In Nanjing, Wu Zhiwei, director from the Center for Public Health Research with Medical School of Nanjing University. Welcome to both of you. Uh, Alice, tell me more about what do we know now with Omicron, the latest variant. Well, it was first reported to the WHO by South Africa on November 24th, but the first confirmed case was detected in a sample that was drawn November 9th. So it's already been about three weeks since at least the first confirmed case uh, was detected. Uh, we know for epidemiologically that it has uh, overcome the dominance of the Delta variant. It looks like in some provinces in South Africa. So uh, within a 10 day period, uh, more than 70% of sequences uh, genetic sequences from the Gauteng province were of the Omicron variant. Previously, the Delta variant, of course, was a dominant strain. Mm. However, uh, it, it looks like in terms of virulence uh, from the epidemiological data and also the anecdotal information that we're getting out of South Africa, that perhaps it is not as lethal or more lethal, at least, than the Delta variant. Uh, even though cases in South Africa have really uh, exploded, the number of daily deaths uh, has not uh, gone up proportionately. Mm. So perhaps in terms of virulence, uh, we don't have as much to fear. The concern, though, is because there is a large number of changes in the genetic code, so about 50 changes as compared to the original ancestral strain, mm. uh, there is a big concern of decreased vaccine effectiveness mm. and also perhaps decreased effectiveness of treatments such as monoclonal antibodies. Right. Talking about those changes, uh, Professor Wu, we did understand that earlier the variants from one from the other actually did not make much change. Uh, it is a uh, two out of uh, 10,000 or 20,000 in a way. So now it seems that uh, with this new variant, the change uh, could be much bigger than it used to be. What could that mean? Epidemiologically speaking, uh, what would they mean? Well, actually this is a uh, very important because uh, if you look at the changes uh, in the uh, spike protein, which actually is a protein virus uses to bind to its uh, cellular receptor to get into the cells. And also this spike protein is the target of the current vaccine and also the antibody uh, uh, therapeutic uh, uh, you know, uh, targets as well. So uh, in that particular region, uh, so far there are 32 uh, changes have been identified, which is uh, the double of Delta variants. So this is uh, uh, just a tremendous number of changes in a relatively short period. So, so that's why it was uh, kind of a surprising to the scientific community. Um, uh, you know, if you look at the carefully uh, where the changes happen, and some of the changes uh, happened exactly in the so-called RBV. RBV is the key region for the current vaccines. So that's why the people are really concerned is that the current vaccine, whether uh, the efficacy will mm. be compromised. So if this is the case, then this will um, you know, raise the alarm and you have to you know, deal with the uh, completely new virus again. China so far has been practiced uh, so-called zero tolerance uh, against the COVID-19, uh, which means if there were cases uh, locally, appearing, uh, likely some small communities will be concealed from the rest of the city so that uh, things would be limited to the utmost. So Professor Wu, now we see more variants are coming out. There seems to be more uh, traveling uh, among other countries before this. So how does China or experts like you assess all of the latest development? By closing the border by sea and the community actually could only delay the 
transmission of the virus, but you won't be able to completely block the virus from entering. So this is something that we have to bear in mind that we are in the face of the pandemic. The virus is not going to be simply blocked and then just die away. I think the critical thing is that we have to increase the vaccination rates. And it's not only talking about a single country, but we have to talk in a global sense and the global uh, communities, uh, cooperation and the unity. So that's why it's very important. If you look at the South Africa, the, the the full vaccination rate is, uh, is about you know, 24, 25%. So it's very low. Uh, I think that this is something actually we need to pay particular attention. You know, in a developed country, industrialized country, when you have a high vaccination rates, the virus slows down. It doesn't necessarily mean that the pandemic is gone. It's going to come back once a new variant arrives. Mm. That's what we're facing right now with the Omicron. I think it's very critical that um, not only by increasing the vaccination rates, but we also need to look at the all possible antiviral drug treatment as well to build up the two shield protection system. So once we reach that, then we could you know, gradually open the society step by step. So this is a, some kind of you know, assurance policy in terms of dealing with a, a, a vicious pandemic. Mm. We did hear Dr. Tan, the president of South Africa, calling on the world to uh, share more of the vaccines. Certainly in the developing world and particularly the least developed economies, things are very slow because uh, there has not been a very good global distribution and contribution system. Now, Dr. Tan, we know earlier we talked about CEPI, Gavi, uh, all of these international platforms trying to do the job, but it seems that it takes much more than that. So, Dr. Tan, so far, what have we learned? Uh, we've learned, just as was stated, that um, either we all rise together out of the pandemic or we all fall together uh, as a global community. And so equitable vaccine uh, distribution must have been our priority. Unfortunately, uh, we, it doesn't look like we'll, we will achieve our goal of 40% of global full vaccination. Uh, by the end of this year, we were hoping to get 70% uh, global vaccination by mid-2022. 20, 20, uh, it doesn't look like we're going to be able to achieve those goals. Mm. And so I think um, if, countries... If, if those goals, Dr. Tan, are not being achieved, what could that mean? Because those goals were set for a reason. It means the pandemic will be prolonged. It means more people will die than need to die. It means that we will be pouring more and more money to try to manage this disease. Mm. Uh, and so it's, it, it, we're losing uh, on all fronts it really does need to become a priority, not just um, health-wise, but I think politically as well, uh, for the entire global community to make sure that there is better equitable uh, distribution of vaccines. Mm -hmm. But then of course, um, the next step is when those antiviral uh, oral pills become available, uh, that we have good uh, distribution of these pills as well. Mm. But also on the pills, uh, there are questions. I mean, it's wonderful to hear the news of the new possibility treatment pills, but with the new variant, once again, there's the challenge whether these pills are relevant anymore or how relevant they could be. Uh, so do the vaccines. So how do you see the latest uh, variant and the function of both the treatment pills and vaccines, Dr. Tan. You know, we hope that the oral pills, the way that they work in terms of the mechanism, they decrease replication of the virus, uh, that this new virus in terms of how it replicates itself in the human body, that they will be preserved. These mechanisms will be preserved. Therefore, the oral pills will still work against the Omicron variant. Uh, but of course, this needs to be tested in a laboratory setting for us to confirm. Uh, but that is the hope among experts that um, Omicron has not made the new pills obsolete even before they're launched. Uh, 
Mm. Um, in terms of vaccine efficacy or effectiveness in the real world, uh, as I said, it doesn't look like uh, right now in South Africa, the vaccines that they're using are the Pfizer vaccine and the Janssen vaccine. Uh, it doesn't look like we're seeing an overwhelmingly high number of deaths, even though Omicron has really taken over some of the provinces like the Gauteng province. So um, perhaps in terms of uh, protecting against hospitalization and death, uh, at least the Pfizer and the Janssen vaccines are doing what they're supposed to do, even in the face of the Omicron variant. China has both the vaccines and also now the treatment pills is already uh, in the process of coming to the market, hopefully very soon later this year. Uh, once again, though, Professor Wu, the same question. Uh, how relevant are these vaccines that China produced and also the treatment pills likely to be with us soon? Well, with uh, current vaccine, I think it still is highly relevant because uh, for the uh, for the Omicron virus to take hold and then take over the Delta virus, it, it will take some time. And currently, we don't know. We don't have enough evidence that this virus will persist as a Delta virus. If you look at the uh, in two years pandemic, there are many other variants as well. And once they emerge, some of them actually only appeared and, uh, and take hold in a small area for a short time and then just uh, vanished. So that's what we saw. If you look at the uh, beta and the Delta viruses, actually, they, uh, they do spread all over the world. So it, it, there are many different factors impacting on the virus spreading. So uh, like what? I, I think that right like now, what? Uh, well, actually, human-human uh, -human contact, the virus, the internal properties, and also immunological uh, sensitivities, there are many various different factors uh, restricting or even uh, sometimes could promoting the virus uh, from uh, uh, transmitting from human to human. But uh, in the current situation, I think people still should take the vaccines and uh, increase the vaccination rates nationwide. I think that's very critical. Now we see more cases in China. Um, mainly, there are cities and towns on the border. For example, the town of Manchuria uh, in Inner Mongolia. Uh, for example, uh, the town of Mohe, uh, also in Heilongjiang province. Uh, you know, the bordering towns, it seems to be now where the major concerns are. And there are new policies suggesting about how people in those uh, towns uh, will be asked if they travel elsewhere in the country. So Professor Wu, tell us more about your thoughts on this. Well, I think, I think you know, this is uh, uh, clear to me that uh, the cross-border traveling is one of the risk factors in bringing the virus. And we have seen in the past uh, many instances, like in Nanjing and in Xiamen and in other cities as well. Uh, the other thing actually indicates to me is that actually uh, checking in the border uh, area uh, for the passengers actually is a relatively easy to find out who actually might be carrying the virus. Mm. Uh, I think this is something actually we, we should uh, increase the uh, cross-border traveling surveillance and the uh, testing of the virus. This is, I think, should be our focus in terms of blocking the virus from uh, exporting into the country. Mm. And then in the domestic front, then we should establish um, uh, establish a, a, a system to uh, trace the contact and the subcontact uh, dissemination. So this is something I think we have uh, built up or accumulated sufficient experience in doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no point that in one city you find one case and then the entire city has to go through the uh, so-called full population uh, nuclear acid testing and the communities got a lot, uh, locked down. Mm -hmm. If you look at the, the outcome of what, what we have been doing, I mean, in some cities, I think it's a complete overreaction because the the, the outcome of this, uh, the entire city either locked down or the full testing generated very little information and new cases. Mm -hmm.